The English Antarctic Expedition. The English Antarctic Expedition was undertaken in 1839 to 1843, mainly with a view to magnetic observations and the determination of the position of the South Magnetic Pole. Two old bomb vessels, the Erebus and Terror, were fitted out under the command of Captain, afterwards Sir James Ross, with Captain Crozier in the Terror. The cruise for the second season was commenced from Tasmania, south of Australia between 42 and 45 degrees south latitude. In November 1840, the Auckland Islands and Campbell Islands were first visited and surveyed, and on New Year's Day 1841, the Antarctic Circle was crossed in about 72 degrees easting. A few days afterwards, the two vessels were beset in the pack ice and began persevering and boring through it. By January 10th, they succeeded and were clear of ice in 70 degrees, 23 minutes south. And next day, land was sighted, rising in lofty peaks and covered with perennial snow. That day, Ross passed the highest latitude reached by Cook in 1773 at 71 degrees, 15 minutes south. On a nearer approach to the land, there was a clear view to the chain of mountains, with peaks rising to 10,000 feet, and glaciers filling the intervening valleys and projecting into the sea. The land interposed an insuperable obstacle to any nearer approach to it. Captain Ross landed with great difficulty, owing to the strong tide and drifting ice, on a small island near the shore named Possession Island, in 71 degrees, 56 minutes south, and 171 degrees, 7 minutes east. Inconceivable myriads of penguins covered the surface, but no vegetation was seen. Next morning, there was a southerly gale which moderated, and on the 18th of January, they were again sailing south in an unexplored sea. No mention is anywhere made of extreme long days to correspond with co-equal latitudes of the north, as there necessarily should be were the earth a globe. On the 23rd day, they were in 74 degrees 20 minutes south, and thus passed the most southern latitude reached by Captain Weddell in 1823. Sailing along the newly discovered coast, Captain Ross landed after much difficulty on an island named after Sir John Franklin in 76 degrees 8 minutes south. Page 328 is the Earth a Globe, Chapter 15. On the 27th, they came in sight of a mountain 12,400 feet above the level of the sea, which proved to be an active volcano emitting flame and smoke in great profusion. It was named Mount Erebus, and an extinct volcano to the eastward, 10,900 feet high, was named Mount Terror. Along the coast, as far as the eye could reach to the eastward, there was a perpendicular cliff of ice from 150 to 200 feet high, perfectly level at the top and without any fissures or promontories on its seaward face. Nothing could be seen above it except the summits of a lofty range of mountains extending southward as far as 79 degrees south. To this range, the name of Perry was given. Captain Ross then sailed along the marvelous wall of ice eastward in 77 degrees, 47 minutes south, as far as 78 degrees south. This barrier was estimated to be a thousand feet thick, and it was followed for 450 miles without a break. The whole of the great southern land discovered by Sir James Ross was named Victoria Land, Imagine, if you can, the amount of centripetal force there must be concentrated to the center of a globe or sphere to hold these mighty walls of ice and mountains of frozen material in place. Is not the statements of the prophet Job easily reconciled with the above? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest at all. Job 38.18 The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. 30th verse of Job of Job 26.10 he hath compassed the waters with bounds until day and night come to an end. In November 1841, the Erebus and Terror again shaped a southerly course, entered the pack ice on December 18th, summer, and once more crossed the Antarctic Circle on New Year's Day. The navigation through a belt of ice 800 miles broad was extremely perilous. At length, on the 1st of February 1842, a clear sea was in sight and they proceeded to the southward in 174 degrees, 31 minutes west. On the 22nd, they were surrounded with lofty icebergs aground, and at midnight, the great ice barrier was sighted and its examination recommenced in 77 degrees, 49 minutes south. Next day, the expedition obtained a latitude of 78 degrees, 10 minutes south, by far the highest ever reached before or since. After escaping imminent dangers and navigating through chains of huge icebergs, 
Captain Ross took his ship northward and wintered at the Falkland Islands. Third Expedition In December 1842, the expedition sailed from Port Lewis on the third visit to South Polar Region, seeing the first iceberg in 61 degrees south. On the 28th, the ship sighted the land named after the Prince de Joinville by Dumont de Ursville, and the south side of the South Shetlands was surveyed. During February, about 160 miles of the edge of the packs were examined. On March 11th, the Antarctic Circle was recrossed for the last time, and the expedition returned to England in September 1843. Thus, after four years' most diligent work, ably conducted and quite unparalleled voyage to the South Polar regions came to an end. Quote, Two islands named Heard and MacDonald were also visited on this wise, November 1853, by Captain Heard of the American ship Oriental. In February, they were driven southward by a gale of wind, and the first iceberg was discovered on the 12th in 60 degrees, 52 minutes south. It was 200 feet high and about 700 feet long. On the 19th, the ship was at a dense pack of ice in 65 degrees, 42 minutes south. And on the 4th of March, they bore up to Australia. Several deep soundings were taken, the greatest depth being 1,975 fathoms, corresponding to about three miles. The route of the Challenger was much the same as that of the Pagoda in 1845, but more to the north. With it ends the somewhat meager record of voyages across and towards the Antarctic Circle. CRM, Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 19, page 330. Antarctic Exploration. We understand by authentic statistics that the expedition of the Challenger and the reports of her crews cost the nation the extravagant sum of over $1 million. This, the necessary result of which that government regards with cautious proposal as to any further scientific advances for any similar expedition. And it, we believe, expressed its discouragement of the proposed Antarctic expedition in connection with the Australian government. The Challenger did not openly admit that it had searched for the South Pole in vain. Oh no, but it sailed three times around the world or upwards of 60,000 miles without being able to say that it had been fortunate enough to ascertain the existence of any such wonderful locality. Of course, it may have gone on searching as long as its timbers or platings held together, and the same disappointment must have attended its efforts. Right here, a thought or two may be suggested to the reader. Were the Earth a globe or spheroid, inside of the Antarctic Circle, the degrees of longitude could not exceed 30 miles to the degree. But if we allow them 30 miles for adversities of winds, currents, ice, etc., and multiply 360 degrees by 60, we have 21,600 in order to make a circuit of 10,800 claimed by all globularists. Yet we can afford to be more liberal. We will call the multiplicator 120 and the product in miles will only reach 43,200, a little over two thirds of their nautical record as above. And most of this inside the Antarctic Circle. But after a circuitous cruise like the above record, and a fruitless expenditure of over a million of dollars, it seems quite natural for them to feel somewhat crestfallen in regard to their previous importunateness with the government. Although the record does not state that they were in search of a South Pole, but a Magnetic Pole. Yes, and where did they expect to find it, if they found any such thing? And what did they expect to call it when found? A suggestion here will do no harm if it does no good. We charge nothing for our advice when it is not followed, the aforesaid expedition could have made just as great a failure with less money. Two or three hundred thousand dollars expended in sending one expedition southwest of Melbourne and a second southeast. They would end themselves at a distance of a thousand miles or so, the same as a rat in a barrel, and still find themselves as far from their magnetic pole as the north is from the south, the east from the west, or the kingdom of heaven is from the earth. But in the words of another, we would say, to be looking for a South Pole at the end of the 19th century just because some pagan astrologers conceived the idea of a planet Earth some 2,000 years ago, and men are yet found who pretend to accept this heathen blasphemy, is presumption in the extreme. The ice barriers which constitute the Earth's circumference extend for some 30,000 or 32,000 miles, but present no opening large enough for the passage of a seal or walrus. No alternation of long days, as in the Arctic region, but the months of May, June, and July are enshrouded in one long dreary night. The snow never thaws, and the crash of the falling icebergs appalls the stoutest hearts. Therefore, unless any expeditions to these regions is conducted with peculiar caution and intelligence, it would very shortly end in discomfiture and dismay to all concerned. 
and if anything is attempted beyond the inquiry whether there is any southeast or southwest passage, no possible result can follow than loss and discredit to the promoters and cruel suffering to the parties engaged.